<clears throat> this week we're just covering labs at, at by the end of the year I hope to have covered all 21 that we use in the chronic disease temperature algorithm we've covered metabolic we covered white blood cell counts we covered uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate so this week we're going to do neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and vitamin D and um, I'm going to talk to you about our our cancer algorithm that we're launching this year we're already running the the algorithm for people that are interested in measuring that risk and I'll talk a little bit about it but but you know if you're if you have your CDT the chronic disease temperature the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and vitamin D are very important markers for cancer and I'll show you the data on that but so you know what give you a little, our little preamble all the all the praise goes to Dr. Trump at Harvard Medical School for developing most of this we've kind of made it simple you know we all live on a health disease continuum so we're measuring that um, this is something I'm, I'm thinking of writing to the, uh, Robert Wood Johnson foundation, but I'm not a real big on grants, but what I say is, you know, with the continuum approach, our approach is not a disease prevention or wellness program. It is a disease reversal program. You know, we eliminate the distinction between disease prevention and reversal by explaining that everyone lies on a health disease continuum. So in other words, a diagnosis is an artificial point on that continuum. In our measurement system, human-made assignments of disease states like diabetes become meaningless as they become arbitrary points along the appropriate continuum. This approach reflects the interconnectedness of biological systems. And uh, then everything, of course, is log linear. One of these days, I'll go on to bore you folks, you insomniacs on that topic. Um, and then we measure lifestyle, environmental determinants, physiology, pathology, using the eye testing, and then disease status. Um, and it actually makes things a lot simpler because there are 69,000 ICD-10 codes for diagnoses. And in our world, there are four mechanisms. So it, 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 they usually don't let us down. Um, you know, and... Uh, the key thing about what we're measuring, 90% of disease is chronic, chronic inflammation driven. And inflammation, like Dr. Trump said, um, is, uh, is a treasure. You got to find out why, you're, why your body is, uh, your immune system's revved up a little bit. And in the case of most chronic diseases, it's revved up literally just a little bit. And that's what makes the challenge. And I'm talking about all this stuff you know, because the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is a very interesting marker in terms of uh, diagnosing uh, what they say insidious. You may not even know you have it. Arguably, the most um, sensitive marker for that is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. No marker is perfect. You always have to have multiple markers that can potentially crop, corroborate the single marker. And why, you know, here's Tyson, you know, CEO, chairman, dies of a heart attack. We're spending money and we're not getting value out of it. You know, the U.S. life expectancy is way down compared to developed nations. All the stuff you've seen. Some other folks, John Warner, president of the American Heart Association, has a massive heart attack at the American Heart Association meeting. Um, you want to live long. This is a study from National Geographic, because if you live long, you live well longer. You live to 100 compared to 80. When you live to 100, your lifespan is 20 years longer, but your health span is 30 years longer. Um, hopefully you've seen that before. And then, you know, we look at your single marker, which is an amalgamation of multiple markers. And on your report, you know, it's a combination of excess early mortality. And, um, you know, one of our little secret sauce, if anybody wants to watch two hours and 45 minutes of, of me on the, and Dr. Carter on the Silicon Valley uh, help and Silicon Valley. What is it? What's the group, Michael? Silicon, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah, Silicon Valley Silicon, health, uh, health Alliance, yeah. I believe. Yeah. And, um, you know. One of the things we use, the reason why multiple markers is better, you know, from a scientific perspective, is that 
none of the markers that we have is truly chronic. The closest one would be A1C and red blood cell distribution width because they're, you know, they're, they're um, tied to the red blood cell life and times, which is 120 days. So that's a pretty good look back. That's why A1C is sort of the average of your sugar and the red blood cell distribution width is sort of the average of the inflammation in your vessels. But every marker has what's called a half-life. You know, if it goes up, um, every, all these markers are quasi-acute phase markers. So in other words, you bang your knee, you see reactive protein will go up. It'll come down. If you're lightly inflamed in your body, see reactive protein will go up and stay up. So how do we tell whether it was you banged your knee versus, um, you know, you, you're chronically inflamed? is by understanding the half-life of the organism, I mean, of the, of the marker, okay? And usually if, if C-reactive protein's up, fibrinogen's up. And you can see very nicely that the half-life for C-reactive protein is very different than the half-life for fibrinogen. So if they're both up relativistically to the same amount, then you're most likely have something chronic going on. It's kind of how we make our uh, deductions. But anyway, um, I'm going to talk about these markers, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, vitamin D. They're much more than markers for cancer. And a lot of the reasons why doctors don't do some of the tests we do is they call the markers nonspecific. In other words, the marker will go up in cancer. It'll go up in Alzheimer's. It'll go up in autoimmune disease. It'll go up in cardiovascular disease. I think I'd want to know that, but... For some reason, the medical community says, well, if it's not specific, we're not interested in it. Yet, LDL, I won't call it cholesterol, LDL goes up when you lose weight. Doesn't sound very specific to me, yet they, they hang their hat on that marker. But anyway, we won't editorialize too much on that. But um, you know, this was an article from, uh, I think, 2017 or 18 from New York Times that basically says, you know, if you think, a lot of us think that cancer is a different type of chronic condition, unrelated to things like diabetes that we completely understand why someone become diabetic for the most part, type two at least. We understand cardiovascular disease, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, bad diet, things of that nature. We think that's the cause cause but you know but cancer for some reason in our view is a little different and uh 41 percent of the american population i thought it'd be higher 41 percent considered cancer the the most feared of all the diseases because they think it can strike suddenly and unexpectedly i don't think that has to be the case children get cancer children very, very, very rarely get heart disease unless they have some trait for uh, elevation in homocysteine. Pretty rare. But children get cancer. But children get the flu. You know, children have high mortality from the flu. Uh, interestingly, they have not so high mortality from COVID. <laughs> um, yet we're doing, vac we're doing quasi vaccines. But to me, it tells me that that then COVID is more response to innate immunity, not adaptive immunity. We talked about that in the past, but won't go into that. So I, I think that's the theme for our new cancer approach that Dr. Carter and I have, are initiating. We're actually looking to raise substantial funds for this because we, we think it's a pretty interesting uh, approach, but um, you know, quite a bit's in your control and lifestyle, but it's the four continuums. It's lifestyle, it's physiology. So we're gonna talk about the physiology. And what we've launched in the, in the cancer space is very similar to our CDT. We call it, you know, well, we're, we're changing the name. The name of the company is Above Cancer, but it's your cancer risk score and it's can, you're also your cancer prognosis score. And it's also your cancer recidivism score. Um, so we position you on the cancer risk continuum but what we've done is we've broken down cancer into six very, I think, um, manageable or understandable categories. Immune health, and we have about six or seven biomarkers that measure immune health. Infection, chlamydia pneumoniae, H. pylori, 
uh, Epstein-Barr, uh, HPV, uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, as we'll see in a minute, damage, you know, how cancer kills, it envelops an organ, shuts the organ down, you die because you need that organ. Um, there are really good markers that measure the deterioration of proteins and other tissue in your body. Uh, inflammation, we know. Metabolic, diabetics get much more cancer. Uh, insulin is highly correlated, among other things, to future cancer risk. So you can handle that. Oxidation, um, ferritin, haptoglobin, things of that nature, highly titrated to cancer risk. I'm not going to go over this. And we're just going to focus now on the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and, and vitamin D. Um, so it'll be a shorter than usual presentation. But, you know, no one measures the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. It requires high math. You have to actually... It's not the neutrophil percent, it's the absolute neutrophil value divided by the absolute lymphocyte value. Very, very simple, very simple calculation. And, you know, we, of course, do it in the CDT. We did the higher math. We actually took the two numbers and divided it. And that's all it is. But, but the more important thing is we did the research on it to show you where it actually shows an increase in early mortality. And um, there's not a lot of studies for it below 1.5. Um, 1.5 we consider an ideal value. But as you'll see, lymphocytes can go down or they can go up. So when lymphocytes go up on the low end of lymph neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, that can be an indicator of a problem as well. But uh, on Monday, I said, go look it up on Wikipedia and just confirm what I'm telling you. Neutrophils go up in the presence of bacterial infection. And lymphocytes go down in the presence of viral infections. And then they say, and cancer. But I, I think the two are very synonymous. But actually, go, um, lymphocytes can also go up in the presence of viruses. So that's why... In the chronic disease temperature, we have an upper and lower range for lymphocytes, like most things. And uh, we pay attention to both those, you know, either either end of that. And it was Dr. Carter who put me on the right path to understand that, you know, it's a virus that'll drive the lymphocytes up or down. So here it is. Here's, uh, here's Wikipedia. Neutrophils are a type of phagocyte found in the bloodstream. During the beginning of inflammation, particularly as a re result of bacterial infection, environmental exposure, and some cancers. Which cancers? Probably those caused by bacteria, like lung cancer, chlamydophilia pneumoniae, gastric cancer, anal cancer caused by H. pylori. So we have, we have a bacteria at the root of, of the cancer anyway. So neutrophils go up with bacteria. Um, let's take a look at lymphocytes. So I'm saying lymphocytes go down. I probably should have switched that arrow, but um, when lymphocytes go up, it's usually a sign of a viral infection. When lymphocytes go down, it's usually the sign of a viral infection. So the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, why I have this little old fashioned RCA Victor here is when you look at the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, as opposed to just looking at the neutrophils or just looking at the lymphocytes, it's really an amplification of the two. So it's really a measure of your major chronic infectious burden um, to, to some degree, but very much with an amplified signal compared to looking at either individually. That's why I have a little amplifier here. So it's a, a very important marker. And, you know, there's, as with everything, um, so lymphocytopenia or lymphopenia occurs when your lymphocyte count in your bloodstream is lower than normal. And I don't have the lymphocytes up here, but, you know, we're looking at sort of like a 1200. Below that, you probably, you're, you know, something is suppressing your lymphocytes. So severe or chronically low counts or possible indication of infection or other significant illness. And I think they should, they could probably 
take this and put a strike across it and just say possible infection and then illness is caused by that. A partial list of, oops, sorry about that. Um, partial list of other causes for low lymphocyte counts. You know, so many people with chemotherapy, their white blood cell count, their white blood cell producing in the bone marrow is really thrown off and it takes them a long time to, um, takes years to build up the ability to produce normal counts of white blood cells. And during that period, they're probably much more vulnerable to cancer, you know, not just cancer recurrence, but the severity of it and a number of other infectious disease, autoimmune disease, lymphoma and other cancers, uh, primary disease of the immune system, things of that nature. So let's look at um, the level. So when I look at the, the, the black and red curve, I see quite a lot of similarity. So I'm saying that you, this is a mortality curve. So you really wanna be at 1.5 roughly or below. And then as you get up higher, we see increasing mortality rates. So this is in the, um, uh, this is like all cause mortality. The Rotterdam study is a very major study, a very important study in my world because um, they're, they're one of 16 studies that shows that cataract and macular disease are systemic diseases with elevated mortality compared to people that don't have those pathologies. So it's a really good, really good broad-based long-term population study. Um, usefulness of the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, uh, looking at breast cancer. So we're seeing a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio less than three, which is still kind of a danger zone. We want it to be below 1.5 versus the greater than three, we see a very significant um, increase in mortality. And keep in mind, you're considered cancer-free if you've survived 60 months. So, you know, you look at the less than three, a lot of people survive longer than 60 months and they're considered probably, you know, cancer-free, but uh, they want their new, really what you want is you want to move your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio down. And it's a completely modifiable risk factor. Increase your vitamin D, increase your cod liver oil, increase your exercise, improve your diet, find infections and find ways to treat them naturally. Um, and, and you can move your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio um, down. Pretty much everybody we work with improves their neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. I am, this will be on, I'm not going to play this audio tonight, but it'll be on the um, video when we produce it. But neutrophil to lymphocyte elevation is associated with poor outcomes in various cancers and has predictive and prognostic value. So this happens to be two researchers from Dana-Farber at Harvard talking about the importance of the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in uh, cancer prognosis. They call it pre-treatment neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Why pre-treatment? Because everybody they studied it in is going to get chemo radiation, or in this case, the biologic drugs. And what they show pretty much without exception is if your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is three, four, five, you know, your survival from treatment is really poor, is really poor. And unfortunately, these are researchers and I was just talking to Dr. Dallas Hack today and he says, you know, and he's a traditional doctor, you know, military doctor. And he says, we know none of the clinic, clinical oncologists are measuring or doing anything about this. They're just treating. So it's like, it's a death camp because it's so easy. I mean, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio at a hospital environment costs nothing. Costs nothing to pull that lab and test it and, and understand its value. So it's really, it's really a shame. So anyway, good videos, as opposed to mine and Dr. Carter's, they're only a minute long. Um, but they get right to the point and just basically say that they're particularly talking about colon cancer, but they say 
that the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio non-specific that's a that's a death knell for any biomarker but the point is these researchers say that it's elevated in many many solid tumors and i'm going to show you data in a few minutes that it's not just solid tumors that it's predictive of and it's not just in middle age and older people as well so hey drum roll here we are so this is something i did monday morning in preparation for the noon talk but basically, I went out and looked at uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, and I didn't even put in a specific type of cancer. I just put a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in cancer and just scanned down um, the, the search results from PubMed. So neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is tied to poor prognosis in at least 31 cancers, probably more. But that was just, you know, that took me a half hour to put this list together. You know, colorectal, prostate, breast cancer, lung cancer, you know, you name it. Cancer in general, you know, plenty of papers just talking about, oh, I got cancer twice. So make it 29. But, you know, these are talking about general all-cause mortality for cancer tied to the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Okay, I got breast twice. So we got to do a little work on our, uh, on our <laughs> Excel. Excel, you know, making sure we get rid of duplicates. So we're now at 20. 29 you know but uh, who's counting but here's here's um the name of the paper tied to each one of these uh links so baseline neutrophil to lymphocyte associated with survival and response to treatment in advanced prostate gastric so here they are esophageal cancer um the important one is um where do we have it but it's, it's predictive in pediatric glioblastomas, I believe. Um, so I'm not finding it very, oh yeah. Elevated neutrophil to lymphocyte may be a feature of pediatric brain cancer patients. So there's sort of like no limit to the predictability of this particular marker. And so this is a, a talk I used to give to IFM and A4M years ago is cancer and infectious disease. And maybe someday I'll do that again. I don't have to change much. Nothing much has changed except there's just more research data, not much clinical application, but more research data on it. And, you know, the whole thesis behind this is, is, is the, uh, the tumor is not the disease. It's a manifestation of an underlying inflammatory, infectious, immune, oxidative stress, you know, repair, metabolic um, milieu in your terrain. Nothing unusual, usual suspects, okay? Um, so this is an old, old, this is from like 2013. So it's cancer and infectious disease, you know, cervical cancer, human papillomavirus, chlamydia trachoma, uh, trachomatis, gastric, esophageal. Now we know colorectal and anal cancer tied to H. pylori, gallbladder tied to salmonella, lung cancer, chlamydia pneumoniae, pancreatic. This is a study at Brown and Harvard. Um, significant increase in risk of pancreatic cancer. And of course, it, its five year sur survival is extremely, extremely low you know, um, tied to uh, periodontal disease. And P. gingivalis is just one of many players out of the mouth. You know, with the oral DNA, we're checking for 11 pathogens. Liver, prostate, it's interesting. Uh, the acne, the acne infection could be tied to prostate. This is a paper, this is a key chart that Dr. Carter and I published in a paper on COVID. Oh, Michael, I haven't published anything since then. That's over uh, almost, almost a year ago. I got to get writing again. Yeah, absolutely. But, oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, these the, the red bars are relative mortality from COVID for different pre-existing conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, respiratory disease, compared to people that are presumed to, have, to be healthy. And, you know, if you know what we're doing, no one's really healthy. But, uh, you know, and some of these people are actually pretty sick. They're just un underdiagnosed. 
but at least we see a significant increase in mortality with well-defined pre-existing chronic conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. And so on this axis, this is the percent mortality, almost, pretty much the percent mortality increase. This is right around one. So this is six times greater, seven and a half times greater, 10 times greater mortality if you have cardiovascular disease compared to healthy people, six times greater, five and a half, five times greater. So a lot higher mortality. What's interesting, if you look at these blue bars, they correspond pretty well with the increased mortality from these pre-existing conditions. The blue bars is a very simple search. High blood pressure and infection in PubMed, National Library of Medicine. You can see not the best correlation, but not a bad one. But here, diabetes, mortality rate from COVID, the number of references that link diabetes to infection. And by the way, the 5.5 is percent mortality for the red, but for the blue, it's the number of references associating, say, infection and diabetes in the millions of papers or millions of references. Look at the correlation between heart disease, mortality, and infection tied to heart disease. Why am I showing these statistics here? Because the common denominator across all these things for risk of COVID is the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. Because the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio uh, accommodates a large number of types of infections, you know, um, virus and, and bacteria lead the way. And so this blue bar is really, a, a, we would use the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio to measure the connection between the infection and the disease. So anyway, let's hop on to vitamin D. And does everybody know that vitamin D is not a vitamin? We're just stuck with that name. It's kind of like a, a copier is a Xerox and a tissue is a Kleenex. Um, we're stuck with the, with the concept that vitamin D is a vitamin. It's not, it's a pro-hormone. It regulates cellular processes. We need it. So vitamin D, the 25-hydroxy vitamin D, you take in D3, gets converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D and it's stored in your fat. It's transported in the fat through soap, also known as LDL. So you need LDL to transport the vitamin D to storage, but you, you activate the vitamin D to make it work. And what does it do? it makes your neutrophils that fight bacterial infection work better, okay? How does it uh, do that? It gets carried to wherever it needs to be carried in soap, LDL. That's how important LDL is. Activated vitamin D helps downregulate inflammation. Activate, activated vitamin D has antibiotic properties that helps the body keep infections under control by stimulating the uh, activity of, of your neutrophils to produce peroxide. So it's an oxidative process. So activated vitamin D really should show, this should be a neutrophil right here. There's your activated vitamin D, this is the neutrophil, and boom, it's, it's clobbering the infection. And vitamin D also has many activities and ensuring normal cellular division. So, you can read papers and it will say vitamin D doesn't help with cancer. You know, getting too much sun causes cancer. You know, pretty much there's 2 million scientific and medical publications a year. And it's uh, many years ago, it was, it was like it was a $60 billion industry, medical research as a separate industry. And it really doesn't communicate back the clinical. But there's every kind of statistic and any kind, every kind of data. So what I try to do sometimes, it's hard to do this, is to find two very objective pieces of data that weren't 
put together at the same time by a researcher looking to come up with a result and then look at the, look at it from that perspective. And I think it gives you a much better lens as to what's really going on. So here we have the overlay of on the United States of two different charts, one by the CDC, which is cancer death rates, all types in the US. So it has nothing to do with population density, it has just to do with population. So red, high mortality from any type of cancer, dark blue, low mortality from any type of cancer. And there's about a two and a half time difference, at least, um, possibly three to four times difference between the, the blue and the red. And then these bars, these lines are from NASA. Has nothing to do with the CDC, just an overlay. And uh, th these lines are how much sunlight is hitting the earth. And of course, the more sunlight, if you're out in the sun, you're synthesizing all kinds of nice molecules on your skin, including vitamin D in its natural form, which is D2, D3, D4, D5, other isomers, and other molecules that aren't well studied or understood that your skin synthesizes. Your skin's the largest organ in your body, and it does a lot of work. It's not just some sort of a plastic sheathing to keep keep junk out. In fact, uh, the stratum corneum, about a few layers down, actually lets certain things through and holds back other things. But what we can see from this chart very clearly is that in areas of low light flux, we see much higher all-cause cancer mortality. And then in areas where high light flux, we see very low all-cause cancer mortality. Yet, you know, we're told to cover up. Michael Hollick on the vitamin D panel on LabCorp and whatever was thrown out of the Dermatology Society, National Dermatology Society, for suggesting the blasphemous thing that we should go out and get sunshine. But, you know, this chart clearly shows. And then this area of the country, they're very active too. So they're outside getting a lot more sun. And then if you look at the older people slathering up in Florida, high mortality, slathering up, making sure in Silicon Valley, your skin's beautiful and they're dying of cancer at a much higher rate. So, um, you know, now is the right time to go out. Um, I spent a good four hours out in the sun today. I'm happy to say, so I have a smile on my face. And I got some good sun. I'm not putting suntan on lotion on right now because the angle of the sun's not that high. And I just, I got some color. What is color? It's excess pigmentation to protect you from the harmful rays of the sun. So if you can go out and titrate your skin, you will get, you know, you will be synthesizing good, you know, components, vitamin D and other things without having the harmful effects of going out in July for the first time and getting burnt. And then squamous and basal cells, these are not dangerous or deadly skin cancers for the most part. Very slow growing, very easily managed. And melanoma, at least half the time, doesn't, it, it's, a, it's a cancer of the inner part of the, the skin. It's truly a, um, um, a skin cancer or a cancer of the skin as opposed to a skin cancer. So half the time it, it happens where the sun doesn't shine. So there's really no correlation. So everybody's fearful of melanoma, but it's really like liver cancer. It's a cancer of the skin tissue. It's not a inflammatory response to sunshine on your skin for the most part. Um, so there's that chart. And why do we have two of them? Well, we have two of them. Okay, but uh, there we go. But anyway, here's some different, see the standard of care level for vitamin D is really based on bone health. You know, vitamin D plays an important role at, along with magnesium and other nutrients, keeping calcium out of soft tissue and putting it in the bone and creating a proper equilibrium in the blood, keep the heart beating and then storage back in the bone. So I think the vitamin D council probably has it best along with 
Mercola, 50 to 100, 40 to 80. Those are much better ranges. Our range is 55 to 100. Uh, my data shows that 55 is sort of the, the best place to, to be. Um, here's some data on it. Um, so um, I'm talking, I'm saying 40 to 70 here, just based on this. If we look at all cause mortality risk, somewhere around 40, we start seeing, you know, leveling off in mortality. Um, here's one that says somewhere in the, somewhere around 55 is ideal. Um, some of these curves are estimates on the, on the upper end, but we, I think somewhere between 55 and 85 is probably the right place to be. Uh, I need, probably need to go back in and look at this one more time, but now I'm bringing in uh, an interesting curve, Michael. Uh -huh. new, I did a, I have a group of, uh, I have a population in a corporation up in um, Michigan, sort of central Northern Michigan. And they, um, they run an energy plant, rough and tumble guys. They all go out fishing and hunting, rough and tumble gals too, by the way. <laughs> but um, what I did with a couple dozen of these folks, because a lot of them had very low vitamin D, is I charted their neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio versus their vitamin D. And remember, we said vitamin D activates the neutrophils. Right, absolutely. So I think it's very interesting, Michael. We get a linear downward curve, very, very linear, p-value of 0 0.005, so very highly correlated that shows that as the vitamin D goes up, the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio goes down. Right, right. Really right. good, really good curve. This is a publishable quality, we like to think. Yeah. But let's see, one, two, three, about, 20, about 24 people that um, we got the data from in just over the last um, couple months. Yeah, perfect. So that, that's all we have to say today. You know, um, we're all in a continuum. You can see how important vitamin D is. You know, people are taking vitamin D or going out in the sun. Maybe they're a little more healthy, health oriented in a multifactorial way. That's fine. But mechanistically, there's no question that vitamin D supports the activity of your neutrophils. So with that, we'll stop the share.
there. And um, Michael, you got to come more to the center of your screen there. Um, okay. How do you how do you test the? Someone said L N R. Assume it's a blood test, but any specific name? Yes, the, it's very simple. You get a complete blood count with differential. Basic, basic test. Complete blood count with differential. And you got to calculate the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio yourself. And it's uh, in a complete blood count with differential, you're going to get uh, white blood cell counts, neutrophil absolute, neutrophil percent, lymphocytes absolute, so on and so forth, red blood cell distribution width, which is really important. But this is the ratio of the absolute neutrophils over the absolute lymphocytes. So it's the actual count, not a percentage. That's all. Very, very easy to test. Typically, on average, how long does it take to change that ratio value given someone is making lifestyle changes, addressing infections, diet, et cetera, and how to approach healing from viral infections such as Epstein-Barr? Michael, I'll let you take that on. Well, I mean, generally, I would say a month or two, but it really kind of depends on where you're starting from with your vitamin D levels. Um, but again, you know, it depends on how out of whack your neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio is. So remember the neutrophils going up, that generally means a lot of, you know, subacute bacterial infections, lymphocytes going down, generally, uh, you know, a number of subacute viral infections. And of course, Epstein-Barr virus, which, you know, causes mono, everyone has been exposed to that. So everyone pretty much on, on the planet, so to speak, really has uh, some exposure, whether, you know, it is reactivated or not is another, you know, uh, uh, question. But in our, you know, database of patients, we see it is pretty common, especially to have the high um, IgG levels, which, you know, can be uh, correlated to the Epstein-Barr virus, um, you know, you know, causing some issues, even in spite of not having, you know, IgM levels um, to Epstein-Barr virus. And, and that's, that's one of those that um, it, it, it can be difficult to suppress the replication. Remember, you know, with any virus, once you are exposed to it, you know, viruses aren't alive. So at the, at the end of the day, it's, it's incumbent upon your immune system to be able to stop the replication to suppress it. So that's why, of all things, vitamin D, among other things, is incredibly important. Yeah, the next question is, so um, optimal vitamin D level different for kids? No, I would say, no. Um, again, no, it's in the 50 to 90 range. Yeah, Keep absolutely. You know, your, your liver will figure it all out. Yeah, absolutely. The, the vitamin D, the 25 hydroxy is stored in your, stored in your fat and pulled out. I mean, the only thing Michael Hollick has shown, there's really no upper level toxicity. The only thing that can happen is you can start creating an imbalance with calcium. So, you know, but you can avert that with uh, K2 and magnesium and, and things of that nature. So I yeah. don't think you'll ever have a problem with that. So wow, even just the vitamin D levels going up can change the neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So we always have to be careful. It's always that bell curve. You know, someone with severe infection, that may not be adequate. It may not be sufficient to push that bacterial infection underwater. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's mechanistically, it's correct. I mean, if it's making your neutrophils work better, yeah. it's literally, let's, let's call vitamin D what it is. It's a vaccine for innate immunity. <laughs> Literally, if it's making, I mean, a, 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 a vaccine makes your, gets antibodies um, peaked up for a specific viral infection. Innate immunity is much more general. It goes after all kinds of infections. So vitamin D is ramping up your innate immunity. It's a vaccine for innate immunity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, last summer, I sat in the sun for 15, 20 minutes at midday. Now I have squamous cell carcinoma on the top of my head. Most surgery this month. Should I protect my head next summer? I mean, so last summer, 
I sat in the sun for 15 to 20 minutes mid midday. Were you sitting in the sun 15, 20 minutes, you know, in April? And then in May? No. no. <laughs> and then in June? Well, so, I mean, like, the, the, the other key is you still have to look at your underlying inflammatory markers, you know, and your, of course your vitamin D level because the propensity to get squamous cell carcinoma still it's it's you know it's 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 still a mix of the nutrient deficiencies in the body what you're eating what you're exposed to how your liver is detoxifying so it's it's never just one thing so even if you have adequate levels of vitamin d is your liver up to the task at detoxing yourself of you know heavy metals you know, mold toxins. Um, yeah, cancers can get out of control for a whole host of reasons. Um, what's a good range for the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio? 0.75 to 1.5. Um, and then how does calcium and vitamin K2 relate to vitamin D? Um, oh, so the cal yeah, so the calcium and vitamin K two. Um, so when you are taking extra vitamin D, that's going to cause your body to absorb more calcium. Problem is, it doesn't allow calcium to be shuttled all the way to the bones and teeth where it's supposed to end up. So you need vitamin K two and magnesium to make sure that full shuttling process occurs. And of course, the vast majority of people are deficient in magnesium as well. So that's a key, um, you know, nutrient to put on your list of things. And also vitamin D, uh, the activation of vitamin D is also dependent on magnesium. Why are the dermatologists so against the sun? <laughs> they're, just, they're no different than any of the society. Right. They're, they're against yeah. your health. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know? can't make it can't make it up they don't they listen to they listen to the wrong sources of information rather than being inquisitive like you folks are and trying to figure out what health really is they get they get told by the people selling the glossy blush uh, brochures that are absolutely and wrong. again most of you know the the you know skin cancers and melanomas are occurring in people who have more of a toxic load. I mean, you, if you generally look at individuals from tropical environments, you know, the, the islands and stuff like that, the incidence of skin cancer, I would dare say, is exceedingly low. And they're out in the sun all the time. It's called, yeah. adap it's called adaptation. <laughs> right. Exactly. Judy, you didn't, add, you didn't adapt. We've got to adapt. So I'm yeah. going on. Look, my, my doctor friend that I go riding with, you know, he's a traditional doctor and he, he, he does know what I do. And he goes, yep. And I just kind of like patch him up and send him back out. But I mean, he's constantly slathering with that suntan lotion. And it's like, but I can't tell him because he's the MD and I'm just, a, I'm just a science guy. Right. Um, so should d vitamin D be taken at the same time? I mean, is, um, should K2 and magnesium be taken with the vitamin D? Oh, did I lose you, Michael? Michael, what happened? Uh, my iPad died. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just stay on here if anybody has any other questions. Yeah, I mean, the, the question is, um, do, you, do you need to take them together? K2, vitamin D. You know, K2 is fat-soluble. Um, vitamin D is fat-soluble, so they stay in the body a while. Magnesium. So I deal to do three, uh, 100 minimum to 300 micrograms a vitamin K2 in the MK7 form, and at least 400 milligrams of magnesium, the elemental magnesium, the ionic magnesium is, is there. I don't know if you heard that because I have my headset on, but at least, Michael, I have you speaking right into my headset. So um, <laughs> thank you for sharing such important information. You're welcome, Jeffrey. Um, do you recommend a specific type of magnesium? You know, magnesium three, yeah. three and eight, Trace elemental research. magnesium. That's what Dr. Carter Trace, recommends. Trace Minerals Research 
is um, that's one of on our full strip. So it's a liquid magnesium that's ionized. What what I do now is if you have any kind of gut symptoms, constipation, diarrhea, reflux, and if your erythrocyte sedimentation rate is up, you really should be taking a liquid vitamin mineral, not a solid, because you're you're not yeah. breaking food down well and you're not going to break that pill down well. Okay, so you know, if you have any of these parameters, you're malabsorbing, your acid weak, you're gonna break down solid things much more slowly. You go for the liquid mineral. So that's part of our our gut titration program. And I I want to give people an update. Um, yesterday, I'll be taking pictures tonight, but yesterday I started my eat dirt program. I went out into the backyard with a teaspoon, grabbed a little bit of dirt from a place in the garden, and I ate it. And okay, I'm, I'm back on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here to report, and I'm going to take pictures of this. It was a little teeny little pebble. So I'm going to be taking pictures of this so you can, so you can follow my progress as the crazy scientist eats more and more dirt every day. <laughs> um, I, I was told by my wife that that's going too far. You know, I'm already telling people to brush their teeth with soap, and now I'm eating dirt. I do not recommend anybody eat dirt unless their gut is perfect and yeah. guess what nobody knows if your gut's perfect right <laughs> well i'm testing mine i think mine's perfect and i'll soon find out but hey, yes, I, had a pretty, I had a pretty good day today michael <laughs> that's good that's good <laughs> <laughs> takes all kinds yeah <laughs> anyway it's soil yeah you got it linda thanks um, oh, a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio of three plus is terminal? No. No, but you know, you're just, you're just more vulnerable. And you know, cancer, when you have the tumor, you're very progressed. I don't care if they call you stage one, stage two, you're very progressed. So that, and then the problem there is the second you have a tumor, you're going to be treated with some immune suppressing treatment okay so you already have a substantial infectious burden that your immune system is trying to handle and now you're being now you're having your immune system suppressed dramatically right that's when it becomes terminal okay you can live a long healthy life with a neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio of four or five but god help you if you get pulled into the clutches of traditional medicine, put on prednisone, biologics, chemotherapy, something like that, that's suppressing your immunity, then all bets are off. Yep. So, and uh, the key point is that, you know, that is just not elucidated from traditional doctors because the, the range for normal white blood cell count is so huge. And, you know, you could have a high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio and then they just Send you home and you're you're fine. You're okay. Yeah. All righty. We'll see you folks next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh -huh. Thank you.